Black Dawn by C. L. Werner Narrated by a Border Prince Labourers bustled about the busy starport of Ios Primaris, capital city of Volskus. Soldiers of the Merchant Guild observed the workers with a weary eye and a ready grip on the lasguns they carried. Hungry men from across Volskus were drawn to the walled city of Iso Primaris, seeking a better life. What they discovered was a cadre of guilds and cartels who maintained an iron fist upon all commerce in the city. There was work to be had, but only at the wages set by the cadre. The merchant guild went to draconian extremes to ensure none of their workers tried to augment their miserable earnings by prying into the crates offloaded from off-world ships. As a heavy loading servitor trundled away from the steel crates it had unloaded, a different sort of violation of the starport's custom was unfolding. Only minutes before, the steel boxes had rested inside the hold of a sleek galliot. The sinister-looking black-hulled freighter had landed upon Volskus hours before, its master, the rogue trader Zweig Barcelo, having quickly departed the starport to seek an audience with the planetary governor. Behind him, Zweig had left his cargo, admonishing the conservator of the port to take special care unloading the crates and keeping people away from them. He had made it clear that the guilders would be most unhappy if they were denied the chance to bid upon the goods he had brought into the Volskus system. Most of the crates the servitors unloaded from the galliot indeed held an exotic menagerie of off-world goods. One, however, held an entirely different cargo. A small flash of light, a thin wisp of smoke, and a round section of the steel crate fell from the side of the metal box. Only a few centimetres in size, the piece of steel struck the tarmac with little more noise than a coin falling from the pocket of a careless labourer. The little hole in the side of the crate was not empty for long. A slender, stick-like length of bronze emerged from the opening, bending in half upon a tiny pivot as it cleared the edges of the hole. From the tip of the instrument, an iris slid open, exposing a multifaceted crystalline optic sensor. Held upright against the side of the box, the stick-like instrument slowly pivoted, searching the area for any observers. Its inspection completed, the compact viewscope was withdrawn back into the hole as quickly as it had materialised. Soon the opposite side of the steel crate began to spit sparks and thin streams of smoke. Molten lines of superheated metal disfigured the face of the box as the cargo within cut through the heavy steel. Each precise cut converged upon the others, forming a door-like pattern. Unlike the small round spy hole, the square car from the opposite side of the crate was not allowed to crash to the ground. Instead, powerful hands gripped the cut section at each corner, fingers encased in ceramite, immune to the glowing heat of the burned metal. The section was withdrawn into the crate, vanishing with a trace into the shadowy interior. Almost as soon as the opening was finished, a burly figure stalked away from the crate, his outline obscured by the shifting hues of the camo cloak draped about his body. The man moved with unsettling grace and military precision, despite the heavy carapace armour he wore beneath his cloak. In his hands, he held a thin, narrow-muzzled rifle, devoid of either stock or magazine. He kept one finger coiled about the trigger of his rifle as he swept across the tarmac, shifting between the shadows. Brother Sergeant Carius paused as a team of labourers and their guild wardens passed near the stack of crates he had concealed himself behind. The single organic eye remaining in his scarred face 
locked upon the leader of the wardens, watching him carefully. If any of the workers or their guards spotted him, they would get their orders from this man. Therefore the warden would be the first to die if it came to a fight. A soft hiss rose from Carius's rifle, long wires projecting outwards from the back of the gun's scope. The scout sergeant shifted his head slightly so that the wires could connect with the mechanical optic that had replaced his missing eye. As the wires inserted themselves into his head, Canius found his mind racing with the feed from the rifle's scope, a constantly updating sequence indicating potential targets, distance, obstructions and estimated velocity. Carius ignored the feed from his rifle and concentrated upon his own senses instead. The rifle could tell him how to shoot, but it couldn't calculate when. The scout sergeant would need to watch for that moment, when stealth would give way to violence. There were ten targets in all. He estimated he could put them down in three seconds. He didn't want it to come to that. There was just a chance one of them might be able to scream before death silenced him. The work crew rounded a corner, and Carrier shook his head to one side, ending the feed from his rifle and inducing the wires to retract back into the scope. He rose from the crouch he had assumed, and gestured with his fingers to the shadows around him. Other scouts rushed from the darkness, following the unspoken commands their sergeant had given them. Three of them formed a defensive perimeter, watching for any other workers who might stray into this quadrant of the starport. The other six assaulted the farocrete wall of the storage facility, employing the lowest setting of the melter axes they had used to silently cut through the side of the cargo crate. Carius watched his men work. The farocrete would take longer to cut through than the steel crate, but the knife-like melter blades would eventually open the wall as easily as the box. The scout marines would then be loosed upon Iso Primaris proper. Then, their real work would begin. Matthias held a gloved hand to his chin and watched through lidded eyes as the flamboyant off-worlder was led into the conference hall. The governor of Volskus and the satellite settlements scattered throughout the Boris system adopted a manner of aloof disdain mixed with amused tolerance. He felt it was the proper display of emotion for a man entrusted with the stewardship of seven billion souls and the industry of an entire world. Governor Matthias didn't feel either aloof or amused, however. The off-worlder wasn't some simple tramp merchant looking to establish trade on Volskus, or a wealthy pilgrim come to pay homage to the relic enshrined within the chapel of the governor's palace. Zwieg, the man called himself, a rogue trader with a charter going back almost to the days of the heresy itself. The man's charter put him above all authority, short of the Inquisition and the High Lords of Terror themselves. For most of his adult life, Matthias had been the absolute ruler of Volskus and her outlying satellites, it upset him greatly to know a man whose execution he couldn't order was at large upon his world. The rogue trader made a garish sight in the dark, gothic atmosphere of the conference hall. Zweig's tunic was fashioned from a bolt of cloth so vibrant it seemed to glow with an inner light of its own, like the radioactive grin of a mutant sump ghoul. His vest was a gaudy swirl of crimson velvet, vented by crosswise slashes in a seemingly random pattern. The hollow globes levitating beneath the hall's vaulted ceiling reflected wildly from the synthetic diamonds that marched along the breast of the trader's vest. Zwieg's breeches were of chuff silk, of nearly transparent thinness, and clinging to his body more tightly than the gloves Matthias wore. Rough, Grok's hide boots completed their gauche exhibition, looking like something that might have been confiscated from an orc pirate. The governor winced every time the ugly boots stepped upon the rich isle rugs which covered the marble floors of his hall. 
He could almost see the psycho-reactive cloth sickening from the crude footwear grinding into its fibres. Zweig strode boldly between the polished obsidian columns and the hanging nests of Nictiro birds that flanked the conference hall. Ignoring the crimson-clad Volskun exubitors who glowered at him as he passed, Matthias was tempted to have one of his soldiers put a shaft of lazlite through the pompous off-worlder's knee, but the very air of arrogance the rogue trader displayed made him reconsider the wisdom of such action. It would be best to learn the reason for Zwieg's bravado. A rogue trader didn't live long, trusting that his charter would shield him from harm on every backwater world he visited. The Imperium was a big place, and it may take a long time for news of his demise to reach anyone with the authority to do anything about it. The rogue trader bowed deeply before Matthias's table. The blue mohawk, into which his hair had been waxed, nearly brushing against the isle rugs. When he rose from his bow, the vacuous grin was back on his face, pearly teeth gleaming behind his dusky lips. The Emperor's holy blessing upon the house of Matthias and all his fortune. May his herds be fruitful and his children prodigious. May his enterprise flourish and his fields never fall before the waning star, Zwieg said, continuing the stilted, antiquated form of address that was still practised in only the most remote and forgotten corners of the segmentum. The governor bristled under the formal salutations, unable to decide if Zwieg was using the archaic greeting because he thought Volskus was such an isolated backwater as to still employ it, or because he wanted to subtly insult Matthias. You may dispense with the formality. Matthias cut off Zweig's address with an annoyed flick of his hand. I know who you are, and you know who I am. More importantly, we each know what the other is. Matthias's sharp, mask-like face pulled back in a thin smile. I'm a busy man with little time for idle chatter. Your charter ensures you an audience with the governor of any world upon which your custom takes you. He spat the words from his tongue, as though each had the taste of sour glass upon them. I, however, will decide how long that audience will be. Zweig bowed again a bit more shallowly than his first obeisance before the governor. I shall ensure that I do not waste his lordship's time, he said. He glanced about the conference hall, his eyes lingering on the twin ranks of exubitors. He stared more closely at the fat-faced ministers seated around Matthias at the table. However, I do wonder if what I have to say should be shared with other ears. Matthias' face turned a little pale when he heard Zwieg speak. Of course, the rogue trader had been scanned for weapons before being allowed into the governor's palace, but there was always the chance of something too exotic for the scanners to recognise. He had heard stories about Jakaro digi-weapons that were small enough to be concealed in a, a synthetic finger and deadly enough to burn through armour plas in the blink of an eye. I run an impeccable administration, Matthias said, trying to keep any hint of suspicion out of his tone. I have no secrets from my ministers or my people. Zweig shrugged as he heard the outrageous claim, but didn't challenge Matthias's claim of transparency. News of the recent fortunes of Volskus have travelled far. Perhaps farther than even you intended, your lordship. An excited murmur spread among the ministers, but a gesture from Matthias silenced his functionaries. Both the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Ecclesiarchy have examined the relic, Matthias told Zwig. They are convinced of its authenticity. Not that their word was needed. You only have to be in the relic's presence to 
feel the aura of power that surrounds it. The bolt pistol of Rebute Gilliman himself, Zweig said. A trace of awe slipping past his pompous demeanour. A weapon wielded by one of the holy Primarchs, son of the god-emperor himself. Volskis is blessed to have such a relic entrusted to her care, Matthias said. The relic was unearthed by labourers laying the foundation for a new Prometheum refinery in the Hizak quarter of Izo Secondus, our oldest city. All Volskans proudly remember that it was there the Primarch led his Adeptus Astartes in the final battle against the heretical Baron Unferth during the Great Crusade, ending generations of tyranny and bringing our world into the light of the Imperium. Zwig nodded his head in sombre acknowledgement of Matthias's statement. My benefactors are aware of the relic and the prosperity it will surely bestow upon Volskus. It is for that reason they contacted me to serve as their agent. The rogue trader reached to his vest, hesitating as some of the exubitors raised their weapons. A nod of the governor's head gave Zwieg permission to continue. Carefully, he removed a flat disc of adamantium from a pocket inside his vest. Wax seals affixed a riotous array of orisons, declarations and endowments to the disc. But it was the sigil embossed upon the metal itself that instantly arrested the attention of Matthias and his ministers. It was the heraldic symbol of House Heraclius, one of the most powerful of the Navis Nobilite families in the Segmentum. I am here on behalf of Nevator Priscos, Zweig announced. House Heraclius is anxious to ensure its dominance over the other great families sanctioned to transport custom in this sector. The Nevator has empowered me to treat with the governor of Volskus to secure exclusive rights to the transportation of pilgrims to view your sacred relic. The agreement would preclude allowing any vessel without a navigator from House Heraclius to land on your world. There was no need for Matthias to silence his ministers this time. The very magnitude of Zweig's announcement had already done that. Every man in the conference hall knew the traffic of pilgrims to their world would be tremendous. Other worlds had built entire cathedral cities to house lesser relics from the Great Crusade and to accommodate the vast numbers of pilgrims who journeyed across the stars to pay homage to such trifles as a cast-off boot worn by the first ecclesiarch and a dented copper flagon once used by the Primarch Lehman Russ. The multitudes that would descend upon Volskus to see a relic of such import as the actual weapon of Rebute Gilliman himself would be staggering. To give a single navigator house a monopoly on that traffic went beyond a simple concession. The phrase, Kingmaker, flashed through the governor's mind. I will need to confer with the full Volskan planetary council, Matthias said when he was able to find his voice. House Heraclius would be a dangerous enemy to make, but conceding to its request would not sit well with the other navigators. The governor knew there was no good choice to make, so he would prefer to allow the planetary council to consider the matter and take blame for the consequences when they came. Zweig reached into his pocket again, removing an ancient chronometer, he made a show of sliding its cover away and studying the phased crystal display. Slowly he nodded his head. Assemble the leaders of your world, Governor. I can allow you time to discuss your decision. Navator Priscos is a patient man. He would, however, expect me to be present for your deliberations to ensure that a strong case is made for House Heraclius being granted this concession. Matthias scowled as Zweig fixed him with that ingratiating smile of his. The governor didn't appreciate people who could make him squirm.
that which serves the glory of the God Emperor is just and will endure. That which harms the Imperium built by his children is false and shall be purged by flame and sword. With burning hearts and cool heads, we shall overcome that which has offended the Emperor's will. Our victory is ordained. Our victory is ensured by our faith in the Emperor. The words rang out through the ancient ornate chapel, broadcast from the Voxcasters built into the skull-like helm of Chaplain Valak, repeated by the speakers built into the stone cherubs and gargoyles that leaned down from the immense basal columns that supported the stained plexiglass ceiling far overhead. Stars shone through the vibrant roof, casting celestial shadows across the throng gathered within the massive temple. Each of the men who listened to Valak's words was a giant, even the smallest of their number over two metres in height. Every one of the giants was encased in a heavy suit of ceramite armour. The bulky armour was painted a dull green, dabbled with blacks and browns to form a camouflage pattern. Only the right pauldron was not covered in the patchwork series of splotches or concealed by fabric strips of scrim. The thick plate of armour above the right shoulder of each giant bore a simple field of olive green broken by a pair of crossed swords in black. It was the symbol that had announced doom upon a thousand worlds. It was the mark of the Adeptus Astartes, the heraldry of the chapter of space marines called the Emperor's War Bringers. This day... I remind the fifth company of its duty, Valak continued, his armoured bulk pacing before the golden aquila looming above the chapel's altar. Unlike the rest of the warbringers, who had removed their helms when they entered the holy shrine, the chaplain kept his visage locked behind his skull-like mask of ceramite. He alone had not covered his armour in camouflage, his power armour retaining its grim black coloration. The Emperor expects us to do that which will bring honour upon his name. All we have accomplished in the past is dust and shadow. It is the moment before us that is of consequence. We do not want to fail him. Through our victory, we shall show that we are proud to serve him and to know that he has chosen us to be his mighty servants. The fifth company is ready for anything, and we shall not be found lacking. Let no doubt enter your mind. We have no right to decide innocence or guilt. We are only the sword. The Emperor will know his own. The Emperor has commanded, and we will follow his holy words before all others. In this hour of reflection and contemplation, we see victory before us. We need only deny the temptations of doubt and seize it. That is the duty of this hour. At the rear of the chapel, Inquisitor Corm listened to Chaplain Valak preach to his fellow warbringers. A guest upon the warbringers' battle barge The Inquisitor had decided to keep himself as inconspicuous as possible. Even Corm felt a trickle of fear in his heart as he heard Valak's fiery words, as he watched the chaplain instill upon the armoured giants kneeling before him a cold, vicious determination to descend upon their enemies without mercy or quarter. Corm knew he was hearing the death of an entire city, echoing through the vaulted hall of the chapel. A twinge of guilt flickered through his mind as he considered how many innocent people were going to die in a few hours. Quorm quickly suppressed the annoying emotion. He'd done too many things over his life to listen to his conscience now. Ten thousand, even a million, hapless citizens of the Imperium were a small price to pay for the knowledge he sought. Knowledge... He alone would possess, 
because only he knew the secret of the relic that Governor Matthias had unearthed. Unleashing the Warbringers upon Volskus was a brutal solution to Korm's problem, but the Inquisitor had learned long ago that the surest way to victory was through excessive force. If there was one thing the Warbringers did better than anyone, it was excessive force. Korm smiled grimly as he listened to the chaplain's closing words. Now, brothers, rise up and let the Emperor's enemies discover the price of heresy. Let the storm of judgment be set loose. The factory worker crumpled into a lifeless heap as the vibro knife punched his neck and slashed the carotoid artery. Carius lowered the grimy corpse to the peeling lino loom tiles that covered the floor. The scout sergeant pressed his armoured body against the filthy wall of the hallway and brought the tip of his boot against the clapboard door the worker had unlocked only a few seconds before. Slowly, Carius nudged the door open. Like a shadow, he slid into the opening, closing the portal behind him. Scout Sergeant Carius had been lurking in the dusty archway that marked a long-forgotten garbage chute, biding his time as he waited for the factories of Iso Primaris to disgorge their human inmates. He had watched as workers trudged down the hall, shuffling down the corridor half-dead with fatigue. He had let them all pass, maintaining his vigil, until he saw the man he wanted. Carius's victim was just another nameless cog in the economy of the Imperium, a man of no importance or consequence. The only thing that made him remarkable was the room he called home. That minor detail had caused fifteen centimetres of gyrating steel to sink into the back of the man's neck. Carius paused when he crossed the threshold. His ears trained upon the sound of the dingy apartment he had invaded. He could hear the mineral-tainted water rumbling through the pipes, could fix the layers of sump rats in the plaster walls, could discern the pebbly groan of air rattling through vents. The scout sergeant ignored these sounds. It was the slight noise of footsteps that had his attention. The apartment was a miserable hovel, ramshackle factory-pressed furnishings slowly decaying into their constituent components. A threadbare rug was thrown across the peeling floor in some vain effort to lend a touch of dignity to the place. A narrow bed was crushed against one wall, a scarred wardrobe lodged in a corner. Table... Chairs, a mouldering couch, a lopsided shelf, supporting a sorry collection of crystal miniatures. These were the contents of the apartment. These and a wide window looking out upon the boulevard. Carius followed the sound of footsteps. The main room of the apartment had two lesser ancillary chambers, a pale closet and a galley. It was from the galley that the sounds arose. The scout sergeant edged along the wall until he stood just at the edge of the archway leading into the galley. The pungent smell of boiling vegetables struck his heightened olfactory senses, along with a suggestion of sweat and feminine odour. Carius dug his armoured thumb into the wall, effortlessly ripping a clump of crumbly grey plaster free. Without turning from the archway, he threw the clump of plaster against the apartment door. The impact sounded remarkably like a door slamming shut. The fragments of plaster tumbling across the floor as they exploded away from the impact resembled the sound of footsteps. Andreas? A woman's voice called. Dinner is... The worker's wife didn't have time to do more than blink as Carius's armoured bulk swung out from the wall and filled the archway as she emerged from the galley to welcome her husband. The vibro knife stabbed into her throat, stifling any cry she might have made. Carius depressed the vibro knife's activation stood, ending the shivering motion of the blade and slid the weapon back into its sheath. Walking away from the body, he shoved furniture out of his way, advancing to the window. The sergeant stared through the glazed glass and admired the view of the boulevard outside. From the instant he had inspected the building from the street below, he had expected this room to offer such a vantage point. 
The apartment door opened behind him, but Carius did not look away from the window. He knew the men moving into the room were his own. Report, Carius ordered. Melter bombs placed at power plant, one of the scouts stated, his voice carrying no inflection, only the precise acknowledgement of a job completed. Melter bombs in position at defence turrets nine and seven, the other scout said. Carius nodded his head. The two scouts had been charged with targets closest to their current position. It would take time for the others to reach their targets and filter back. The sergeant studied the chronometer fixed to the underside of his gauntlet. The attack would not begin for some hours yet. His squad was still ahead of schedule. By the time they were finished, all of Iso Primaris's defence turrets would be sabotaged, leaving the city unable to strike any aerial attackers until it could scramble its own aircraft. Carrier shook his head as he considered what value the antiquated PDF fighters would have against a Thunderhawk. The defence turrets had been the only real menace the Space Marines could expect as they made their descent from the orbiting battle barge, the deadly Deathmonger. Other melter bombs would destroy the city's central communication hub and disable the energy grid. Iso Primaris would be plunged into confusion and despair even before the first warbringers descended upon the city. The local planetary defence force was of little concern to the warbringers. Unable to contact their central command, they would be forced to operate in a disjointed, fragmented fashion, a type of combat for which they were unprepared. There was only one factor within Iso Primaris that might prove resilient enough to react to the havoc preceding the Warbringer's assault. Carius motioned with his hand, gesturing for the two scouts to occupy rooms to either side of the apartment he had secured. The scouts slipped back into the hall, with the same silence with which they had entered. Carius unslung the needle rifle, looped over his shoulder. The back of the scope opened, sending wires slivering into his artificial eye. Through the prism of the rifle's scope, Carrier studied the massive fortress-like structure of plasteel and ferrocrete that rose from the squalor of the district like an iron castle. A gigantic imperial aquila was etched in bronze upon each side of the imposing structure. The precinct courthouse of the city's contingent of Adeptus Arbites. Brutal enforcers of the Lex Imperialis, the Imperial Law, every world within the Imperium was bound by. The Arbites had the training, the weapons and the skill to prove a troublesome obstacle, if allowed the chance. Carius and his scouts would ensure the arbitrators did not get that chance. Their mission of sabotage completed, the scouts would fan out across the perimeter of the courthouse, Sniper fire would keep the arbitrators pinned down inside their fortress. In time, the arbitrators would find a way round the lethal fire of Carrius and his men. By then, however, the Warbringers would have accomplished their purpose in Iso Primaris. Carrius watched as armoured arbitrators paced about the perimeter fence, separating the courthouse from the slums around it. His fingers rested lightly against the trigger of his rifle the weapon shifting ever so slightly as he maintained contact with the target he had chosen. When the signal came, Carius and his scouts would be ready. It wasn't really surprising that the Planetary Council of Volskus met in a section of the Governor's Palace. Matthias was a ruler who believed in allowing his subjects the illusion of representation, but wasn't foolish enough to allow the council to actually conduct its business outside his own supervision. Even so, there were times when the representatives of the various merchant guilds and industrial combines could be exceedingly opinionated. Occasionally, Matthias had found it necessary to summon his excubators to maintain order in the council chamber. The debate over the proposal Zvig had brought to Volskus was proving to be just such a divisive subject. Lavishly appointed gilders roared at fat Promethean barons, the semi-mechanical tech priests lashing out against the zealous oratory of the robed ecclesiarch, even the handful of wiry rogues representing the trade unions 
felt they had to bare their teeth and demand a few concessions to compensate the unwashed masses of workers they supposedly championed. As soon as one of the industrialists or guilders tossed a bribe their way, the union men would shut up. The others would be more difficult to silence. Arguments arose over the wisdom of defying the other great families by honouring the request of House Heraclius. Some felt that the pilgrims should be able to reach Volscus by whatever means they could. Others claimed that by having a single family of navigators controlling their traffic, there would be less confusion and more order. Those guilders and industrialists who already had exclusive contracts with House Heraclius to ship goods through the warp, sparred with those who had dealings with other navigators and worried about how the current situation would impact their own shipping agreements. Throughout it all, Matthias watched the Planetary Council shout itself hoarse and wondered if perhaps he should have bypassed them and just made the decision himself. If anyone had been too upset with his decision, he could always have sent the PDF to re-educate them. He glanced across the tiers of the council chamber to the ornate visitors' gallery. No expense had been spared to make the gallery as opulent and impressive as possible. Visiting dignitaries were surrounded by vivid hollow pics of assorted scenes of Volscan history and culture. The walls behind them covered in rich tapestries depicting the wonders of Volscan industry and the extensive resources of the planet and her satellites. If... The vicious debates of the Planetary Council failed to interest a visiting ambassador. The exotic sculptures of Volscan beauties would usually suffice to keep him entertained. Zweig, however, didn't even glance at the expensive art all around him in the gallery. He stubbornly kept watching the debate raging below him, despite the tedium of such a vigil. Matthias could tell the rogue trader was bored by the whole affair, he kept looking at his antique chronometer. The governor chuckled at Zweig's discomfort. The man had asked for this, after all. He kept pestering Matthias about when the council could be gathered and if all the leaders of Volskus would be present to hear him make his case for Novatar Priskos. Despite repeated assurances from the governor, Zweig had been most insistent that all of the men who controlled Volskus should be in attendance when he introduced the navigator's proposal. Well, the rogue trader had gotten his wish. He had presented his proposal to the planetary council. Now he could sit back and wait a few weeks for their answer. Matthias chuckled again when he saw Zweig fussing about with his chronometer again. The governor wondered if the rogue trader might consider selling the thing. Matthias had never seen a chronometer quite like it. He was sure it would have made an interesting addition to his private collection of off-world jewellery and bric-a-brac. The governor's amusement ended when there was a bright flash from Zvig's chronometer. At first, Matthias thought perhaps Zvig's incessant toying with the device had caused some internal relay to explode. It was on his lips to order attendance to see if the rogue trader had been injured, but the words never left his mouth. Shapes were appearing on the gallery besides Vig, blurry outlines that somehow seemed far more real than the hollow picks playing around them. With each second the shapes became more distinct, more solid. They were huge, monstrous figures twice the height of a man and incredibly broad. Though their outlines were humanoid, they looked more machine than man, great bulky brutes of tempered plasteel and adamantium. Matthias stared in shock as the strange manifestations began to move, lumbering across the gallery. The giants were painted in a dull olive drab, mottled with splashes of black and brown to help break up their outlines. If not for the confusing blur of colour, the governor might have recognised them for what they were sooner. It was only when one of the giants shifted its arm, raising a hideous rotary autocannon over the railing of the gallery, that the governor saw the ancient stone cruciform bolted to the armoured shoulder. It was then that he knew the armoured giants surrounding Zweig were space marines. The chronometer Zweig had been toying with was actually a homing beacon. The space marines had fixed the beacon's location and teleported down into the council chamber. There could be no doubt as to why. 
For some reason, the rogue trader had brought death to the leaders of Volskus. A hush fell upon the chamber as the councillors took notice of the five giants looming above them from the gallery. Arguments and feuds were forgotten in that moment as each man stared up into the waiting jaws of destruction. Some cried out in terror. Some fell to their knees and pleaded innocence. Others made the sign of the Aquila and called upon the Emperor of Mankind. Whatever their reaction, their end was already decided. In unison, the warbringers in their heavy Terminator armour opened fire upon the cowering councillors. Five assault cannons tore into the screaming men, bursting their bodies as though they were rotten fruit. In a matter of seconds, the ornate council chamber became a charnel house. Sirens blared throughout Iso Primaris. Smoke curled skywards from every quarter, turning the purplish twilight black with soot. Crisis control tractors trundled into the streets, smashing their way through the evening traffic, oblivious to any concerns save that of reaching the stricken sections of the city. No industrial accident, no casual arson in a block of filthy tenements, not even the tragic conflagrations of the opulent residents of a gilder could have provoked such frantic, brutal reaction. The explosions had engulfed the defence batteries, all five of the massive forts crippled in the blink of an eye by melter bombs. Even as their crisis tractors smashed a path through the crowded streets, tossing freight trucks and commuter sedans like chaff before a plough, more explosions ripped through the city. Lights winked out. A malignant darkness spread throughout the capital. A pillar of fire rising from the heart of the metropolitan sprawl was the only monument to the site of Iso Primaris's central power plant. It would be hours before tech priests at the substations would be able to redirect the city's energy needs through the battery of backup plants. They wouldn't even try. To do that, the tech priests required absolution from their superiors. The destruction of the communications hub made the earlier explosions seem tame by comparison. Plasteel windows cracked a kilometre and a half away from the cloud of noxious smoke that heralded the silencing of a planet. A skyscraper of ferrocrete and reinforced armour plas, the communications tower, had bristled with satellite relays and frequency transmitters. Its highest chambers, 500 metres above the ground, devoted to the psychic exertions of the planet's astropaths. Governor Matthias, always mindful of his own security and power, had caused all communications on Volskus to be routed through the tower, where his private police could check every message for hints of sedition and discontent. Now the giant tower had fallen, brought to ruin by the timed blast of several melter bombs planted in its subcellars. With the death of the hub, every vox caster on Volskus went silent, all except those trained upon a different frequency, a frequency being relayed from a sinister vessel in orbit around the planet. Iso Primaris maintained three PDF garrisons within its walled confines, two infantry barracks and a brigade of armour. Despite the silence of the vox casters and their inability to raise anyone in central command, the soldiers of the Volskan planetary defence forces were not idle. Lasguns and flak armour were brought from stores. Companies and regiments were quickly mustered into formation. There was nothing to disturb the hasty muster of soldiers at the two infantry barracks. The tank brigade was not so fortunate. The scout marine who had visited them had not placed melter bombs about their headquarters or tried to sabotage the fifty Lehman Russ pattern tanks housed in the base's motor pool. What he had done instead was even more deadly. A bright flash burst into life at the centre of the courtyard, where the PDF tankmen were scrambling to their vehicles. A survivor of the massacre in the council chamber would have recognised that flash, would have shouted a warning as hulking armoured shapes suddenly appeared. From the orbiting battle barge, five more Terminators had followed a homing beacon and been teleported with unearing precision to their target. The olive drab giants opened fire upon the tank men, tearing their bodies to pieces with concentrated fire from their storm bolters. One of the space marines, 
His bulky armour, further broadened by the box-like weapon system fastened to his shoulders, targeted the tanks themselves. Shrieking as they shot upwards from the cyclone missile launcher, a dozen armour-bursting crack missiles streamed towards the PDF tanks. The effect upon the armoured vehicles was much like that of the storm bolters upon the stunned tankmen. Reinforced armour plates crumbled like tin foil as the missiles slammed home. Their shaped warheads punching deep into the tank's hull before detonating. The effect was like igniting a plasma grenade inside a steel can. The tanks burst apart from within as the explosives gutted their innards. In a few minutes, the surviving tankmen retreated back into their barracks, seeking shelter behind the thick farrow creep walls. The Terminators ignored the sporadic lasgun fire directed on them, knowing there was no chance such small arms fire could penetrate their armoured shells. They turned away from the barracks, maintaining a vigil on the gated entryway to the motor pool. Despite the carnage they had wrought, the mission the Terminators had been given was not one of slaughter. It was to keep the tanks from mobilising and spreading out into the city, where they might interfere with the Warbringer's other operations. Carius followed the reed from his scope and open fire. He aimed thirteen centimetres above the arbitrator he had chosen for his victim, allowing for the pull of gravity upon his shot. The slender, silver-like needle struck home, slicing through the arbitrator's jaw just beneath the brim of his visor. The enforcer didn't even have time to register pain before the deadly poison upon the needle dropped him. His body twitched and spasmed upon the cobblestones outside the courthouse, drawing in other arbitrators, rushing to investigate their comrade's plight. Three more of the enforcers were dropped as the other snipers staged around the courthouse opened fire. The arbitrators fell back into their fortress, employing riot shields to protect themselves as they withdrew. Carriers kept his rifle aimed upon the entrance of the courthouse. Experience and the MEM training he had undergone when a neophyte told Carius what to expect next. These arbitrators were especially well trained, the sergeant conceded. They beat his estimates by a full minute when they emerged from the courthouse in a phalanx, employing their riot shields to form a bulwark against the sniper fire. Emotionlessly, Carius scanned the crude defensive line. He nodded his head slightly when he saw the man he wanted. The judge wore a storm cloak over his carapace armour and a golden eagle adorned his helmet. Carius aimed at that bit of ostentation, sending a poisoned needle sizzling through one of the riot shields to embed itself in the beak of the eagle. The judge felt the impact of the shot, ducking his head and reaching to his helmet. The scout sergeant wasn't disappointed when he saw the judge's face go white when his fingers felt the slivers of Carius's bullet embedded in his helmet. The judge rose and shouted at the arbitrators. It was again to the credit of the enforcers that they did not allow the judge's panic to infect them, and their second retreat into the courthouse was made in perfect order, the phalanx never disintegrating into a panicked mob. Carius leaned back, resting his elbows against the sill of the window, the next thing the arbitrators would try would be to use one of their rhino armoured transports to effect a breakout. Brother Domitian would be in position with his heavy bolter to thwart that attempt. After that, the enforcers would have to think about their next move. Carius was content to let them think. While the arbitrators were thinking, they would be safely contained inside the courthouse, where they couldn't interfere with the warbringers. With the defence batteries destroyed and communications down, there was no warning for the people of Iso Primaris when five gun-laden assault craft descended upon the city. Two of the powerful Thunderhawk gunships hurtled into the Farrow Creek canyons of the city, guided through the black maze of the darkened metropolis by hollow maps taken by the battle barge from orbit. As the Thunderhawks progressed, only a dozen metres above the streets, their speed gradually slowed. Intermittent bursts of las cannon fire slammed into the sides of buildings or gouged craters from the tarmac. Screams of terror rose from civilians as they streamed from their wounded homes, filling the streets with a mass of frightened humanity. 
Coldly, with a callous precision, the warbringers employed the heavy bolters mounted upon their thunderhawks to herd the frantic mob through the streets. The objective of this brutal tactic soon showed itself. The infantry regiments were finally marching from their garrisons, trying to restore order to the stricken city. The desperate mob rushed into the face of their marching columns. The PDF commanders hesitated to give the order to open fire on their own people. The delay could not be recovered. Even as the belated command was given, the civilians were crashing into the soldiers, confusing their ranks, breaking the cohesion of their units. The Thunderhawks dropped still lower, the ramps set into the rear of their holes opening. Green armoured giants jumped from the moving gunships, rolling across the tarmac as they landed. Each of the warbringers was soon on his feet again, the lethal bulk of a bulk gun clenched in his steel gauntlets. While the PDF still fought to free themselves of the civilian herd, the Space Marines moved into position, establishing a strong point at the intersection nearest their enemies. Both Thunderhawks surged forwards with a burst of speed, sweeping over the embattled PDF troops. One soldier managed to send a rocket screaming up at one of the gunships, the warhead impacting against the hull and blackening the armour plate. Any jubilation over the attack was quickly extinguished as the Thunderhawks reached the rear of the PDF columns. Spinning full around, the gunships came back, their las cannons blazing. The withering fire slammed into the PDF regiments, forcing them forwards. It was their turn to be herded through the streets, herded straight into the waiting guns of the warbringers on the ground. Of the remaining Thunderhawks, one sped across Iso Primaris to disgorge its cargo of power-armoured giants at the armour base so that they might support the action entrusted to the Terminators. The other two made straight for the Governor's palace. The compound was in a state of siege, frightened citizens hammering at its gates, demanding answers from their leaders. The red-uniformed exubitors held the mob back, employing shock moulds to break the arms of anyone trying to climb over the walls, using las pistols on those few who actually made it over the barrier. The gunships unleashed the fury of their heavy bolters into both mob and guards, the explosive rounds shearing through the crimson armour of the exubitors as though it were paper. Citizens fled back into the darkened streets, wailing like damned souls as terror pounded through their hearts. The exubitors attempted to fall back to defensive positions, but the punishment being visited on them by the heavy bolters soon caused the guards to abandon that plan and retreat back into the palace itself. In short order, a landing zone had been cleared. The Thunderhawks descended into the lush gardens fronting Governor Matthias's palace. The backwash of their powerful engines, crushing priceless blooms imported from terror into a mess of mangled vegetation. Armoured ramps dropped open at the rear of each gunship. Ceramite encased giants rushed to assume a perimeter around the garden. Two gigantic machines, lumbering monstrosities twice as tall as even the most gigantic space marine, emerged from the Thunderhawks behind the Warbringers. Vaguely cast in a humanoid form, the torso of each space marine encased the armoured sarcophagus of a crippled Warbringer. His mind fused to the adamantium body which now housed it. The Dreadnoughts were revered battle brothers of the Warbringers, ancient warriors who fought on through the millennia in their ageless metal tombs. The two Dreadnoughts fanned out across the gardens, one training its deadly weapons on the walls at the front of the compound, the other racing towards the palace itself. Almost immediately the huge machine was spurred into action as solid shot from a heavy stubber mounted in an ornate coupler began firing upon it. The bullets glanced off the Dreadnought's thick hull, barely scratching the olive drab paint that coated it. Power hissed through the oversized engine coils of the immense weapon that was fitted to the machine's left arm. When the coils began to glow with the intensity of a supernova, the Dreadnought pivoted at its waist and raised the arm towards the coupler. 
A blinding burst of light erupted from the nozzle that fronted the dreadnought's cumbersome weapon. The blazing ball of gas sizzled across the gardens, striking the cupola at its centre. Instantly, the structure vanished in a great cloud of boiling nuclear malignance as the charged plasma reacted with the solid composition of the cupola. The plasma gun immolated the exubitors who had fired upon the dreadnought, reduced their heavy stubber to a molten smear and fused the cupola into something resembling a charred brick. After that, an eerie silence fell across the compound. The governor's guards were not about to provoke the wrath of the dreadnoughts a second time. With the dreadnoughts in command of the exterior, the twenty warbringers left the defence of the perimeter to their ancient brethren and rushed the palace itself. Gilded doors, designed to withstand the impact of a freight tractor, were quickly shattered by the chain swords of the space marines. The diamond-edged blades tearing through the heavy all-wood panels and the plasteel supports. As the first warbringers breached the doors and entered the palace itself, Inquisitor Corm emerged from one of the Thunderhawks, his imposing figure dwarfed by the huge armoured warriors who flanked him. Captain Fazaz held his helmet in the crook of his arm, exposing a leathery face and a forehead bristling with steel service studs. Chaplain Valak, as ever, kept his countenance locked behind the death's head mask of his helm. Fazaz pressed a finger against his ear, closing one eye as he digested the voxed cast being relayed to him. Squad Bothius has secured the compound, he told Corm. The captain's grim face twisted in a scowl. Zweig reports that Governor Matthias escaped before the operation was complete. Some kind of personal force field. We will track down the heretic, Corm assured the fearsome Fazas. There is no escape for him. With his regime broken, he will try to flee Voskos. The Inquisitor's eyes burned with a fanatical light, his lip curling in disgust. First, he will try to secure his most precious treasure. The obscene shall be cast low in the midst of their obscenity, Chaplain Valak's stern voice intoned. For them, death is but the doorway to damnation. Corm turned away from Valak and directed his attention back to Fazaz. Have your men search the palace, sweep through it room by room. Matthias must not leave the compound with the relic. The warbringers know their duty, Fazaz answered, annoyance in his tone. The heretic will be found. The relic will be destroyed. He spoke as though both tasks had already been accomplished. Statement rather than speculation. Corm knew better than to question the captain's belief in his men. A man didn't live long enough to become an inquisitor, if he were a fool. Governor Matthias had retreated to a fortified bunker deep beneath his palace. The warbringers had intercepted the governor before he could reach his escape route, a private tunnel connecting the complex to the underrail network beneath Iso Primaris. Twenty exubitors had been killed in the ensuing firefight. Matthias and his ten surviving guards had fallen back to the bunker, designed to be proof against rebellion and civil unrest. The governor's bunker proved no obstacle to the warbringers. Warriors used to breaching the bulkheads of renegade starships and assaulting the citadels of Xenos armies. The huge steel doors that blocked the entrance to the bunker were quickly reduced to slag by a concentrated blast from a plasma cannon. The warbringers rushed through the opening while molten metal still dripped from the frame. One of the power-armoured giants vanished in a burst of light, Flesh and ceramite liquefied by the searing energy that smashed into him. Instantly, the other warbringers flattened against the walls, voxing warnings to their comrades. Matthias only had a few guards left to him, but these last exubitors had something the others didn't. They had a multi-melter. The crimson-armoured exubitors swung the heavy weapon around on its tripod. Nestled behind a farocrete pillbox, the guards tried to bring their deadly weapon to bear on the warbringers already in the corridor. The armoured giants could see the barrels of the multi-melter pivoting within the narrow loophole. 
One of the warbringers racked his bolter gun and emptied a clip into the pillbox, the explosive rounds digging little craters in the thick surface, drawing the attention of the gun crew. As the multi-melter swung around to fire on the shooter, he threw himself flat to the floor. The superheated beam of light flashed through the air above him, melting the stabiliser jets and air purification intakes on the Warbringer's backpack, but doing no harm to the Space Marine himself. Instantly, the other Warbringers in the corridor charged the pillbox. It would take three seconds for the multi-melter to cool down enough to be fired again. The Space Marine intended to have the strong point disabled before then. The foremost of the armoured giants reached to his belt, removing a narrow disc of metal. He flung this against the face of the pillbox, black smoke filling the corridor as the blind grenade exploded. The optical sensors built into the Warbringer's helmets allowed them to pierce the dense cloud of inky smoke. The exhibitors inside the pillbox were not so fortunate. Frantically, they tried to fire the multi-melter into the darkness, the blazing beam of light striking only the farocrete wall of the bunker. Pressed against the face of the pillbox, two of the Warbringers pushed tiny discs through the loophole then turned away as the frag grenades detonated inside the strong point. The menace of the multi-melter was over. The Warbringers swept around the now silent pillbox, pressing on down the corridor. Laz bolts cracked against their power armour as they converged upon an armour-plus barricade thrown across the middle of the hallway. The Governor and the last of his guards, mounting a hopeless last-ditch effort to deny the oncoming Space Marines, this is an unjust act, Matthias shrieked. I have paid the Imperial tithe. I have exceeded the conscription levels for the Imperial Guard. You have no right here. Volskus is loyal. The governor's desperate plea went unanswered by the Space Marines, sweeping down the hall. Precise shots from the huge bolt guns the Warbringers bore brought death to two of the remaining exubitors. A third threw down his weapon, climbing over the barricade in an effort to surrender. A bolt round tore through his chest, splattering his organs across the armor-plus fortifications. The orders the Warbringers were under had been explicit. No prisoners. Surrender the relic! The sepulchral voice of Chaplain Valak boomed through the bunker, magnified by the Vox amplifiers built into his skull-faced helm. The black-armoured warbringer marched down the corridor, the winged Crozius clenched in his fist, glowing with power as he approached the barricade. Atone for your faithlessness, and be returned to the Emperor's grace in death. The governor cringed as he heard Valak's words but quickly recovered, his face pulled back in a sneer of contempt. The relic! This is why you have destroyed my city! Bitter laughter choked Matthias' voice. The noble Adeptus Astartes, sons of the Emperor, common thieves! Perhaps the governor might have said more, but his tirade had focused every bolter in the corridor upon him. Matthias was thrown back as the concentrated fusillade struck him, tossing his body back from the edge of the barricade. The last two exubitors, their reason broken by the hopelessness of their situation, broke from cover and charged straight towards the warbringers, their lasguns firing harmlessly at the power-armoured giants. Chaplin Valak pressed forwards, climbing over the barricade and walking towards the crumpled body of Governor Matthias. The Governor's reductor field had prevented the fusillade from ripping apart his body, but hadn't been equal to the momentum of the shot. The impact had hurled him across the corridor to crash against the unyielding farocrete wall. There was no sympathy as Valak stared down at the broken Governor. Even with half his bones shattered, Matthias tried to defend the object cradled against his chest. Wrapped tightly in a prayer rug, soaked in sacred ungents, and adorned with waxen purity seals and parchment benedictions. Even now the governor could feel the supernatural power of the relic giving him strength. Yeah, have no right, 
Matthias snarled at Valak. Ribute Gilliman left it here, left it for Volskis. No. Valak's pitiless voice growled. He raised the heavy crozier he carried, energy bristling about the club-like baton. He didn't leave it. The chaplain brought his staff, smashing down, its power field easily bypassing the reductor field that protected the governor. Matthias's head was reduced to pulp beneath Valak's blow. Grimly, Valak removed the relic from the bloodied corpse. Turning away from Matthias's body, the chaplain began stripping away the pious adornments that surrounded the relic, flinging them aside as though they were unclean filth. Soon he exposed a bolt pistol of ancient pattern, its surface encrusted by millennia of decay and corrosion. You have secured the relic, Inquisitor Corm beamed as he marched down the corridor, Captain Fazaz beside him. A triumphant smile was on Corm's lean face. We must get it to the fortress on Titan, so that the Ordo Malleus may study it. Valak shook his head. No, he intoned, his fist clenched tight about the bolt pistol, the pressure causing some of the corrosion to flake away, exposing the symbol of an eye engraved into the grip of the gun. It is an abomination and must be purged. You have brought us here to do the Emperor's work, and it shall be done. Corm stared in disbelief at the grim warbringer chaplain. The Inquisitor had been the one who had uncovered the truth about the relic so recently discovered on Volskus, a truth locked away in the archives on Titan. Rebute Gilliman had indeed been on Volskus, but it had not been the Ultramarines or their Primarch who had brought the planet into the Imperium, though such was the official version preached by the Ecclesiarchy and taught in sanctioned histories of the world. The real liberators had been the lunar wolves. If a Primarch had left a relic upon a Volscan battlefield, it had been left by that of the lunar wolves. It had been left by the arch-traitor, War Master Horus. The fearsome chaplain marched across the bunker to the shambles that had been left of the pillbox. Clenching the relic in one hand, Valak ripped the damaged multi-melter from the emplacement. Corm gasped in alarm as he understood the chaplain's purpose. The relic was tainted, a thing of heresy and evil to be sure, corrupting even the innocent by pretending to be something holy. But it was more important that it be studied, not destroyed. Fazaz laid a restraining hand upon Corm's shoulder before the Inquisitor could interfere. Two fates present themselves, the captain told him. You can return to Titan a hero, who has brought about the destruction of an unholy thing. Or you can be denounced as a Herosian radical, and perish with the relic. Make your choice, Inquisitor. Sweat beaded Corm's brow, as he watched Chaplain Valak throw the relic onto the ground and aim the heavy multi-melter at it. At such range, the bolt pistol would be reduced to vapour, annihilated more completely than if it had been cast into the centre of a sun. Corm knew he would share the same annihilation if he broke faith with the warbringers. The Adeptus Astartes had a very narrow definition of duty and honour. Anything tainted by contact with heresy was a thing to be destroyed. As he watched Valak obliterate the relic, Corm decided to keep quiet. He'd been an Inquisitor for a long time. A man didn't last that long, if he were a fool. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, bit of an odd thing. There's, there's some odd moments in there, but I think generally pretty good story. Uh, interesting. I was, I was a bit concerned about the camouflage on the Marines, because that's a thing that Marines don't do. And... It's been stated by them in law many times and in novels and stuff why they don't because it's like uh, it's their honor. Uh, they're not hiding. They're not being cowardly. They're fighting the enemy straight on in their their colors, which represent them. You know, they are they are the chapter. They are the legion. They do not hide. They fight. You know, and it's 
it's a nice, well, I could go into more detail on that. I probably should make a video at that, about that, going deep on it. But anyway, it's like a chivalric sort of honor thing. Um, but, but in the vastness of the universe, there's going to be chapters out there who have been so broken apart from their original legions, whatever founding they happen to be, you know, whatever sort of chapter they happen to be. Maybe they've had nothing to do with the, the founding chapter, the founding legion that they uh, have, they draw their bloodline from or whatever. And, you know, maybe they, they, their internal culture has changed to such an extent that they don't value that anymore. And they think, well, yeah, camouflage is a really good idea. <laughs> Let's not paint ourselves yellow. And charge at me, <laughs> charge at, uh, <laughs> and charge at machine guns. Let's not do that. Let's uh, let's be camouflage because <laughs> it's probably better. But there's a lot of stealth stuff in here as well, which is nice. Um, interesting. I've never heard of the Warbringers before. I don't know if I've read any of CL Werner's stuff. I know he wrote he wrote a lot of fantasy stuff, um, and that's why I think maybe he's not a hundred percent on Space Marine stuff. But then again, with all the stories I've done yeah, that you've listened to. <sighs> It's very, you know, it's shocking how often people get stuff wrong, isn't it? <laughs> and this is all like a visually sanctioned stuff, or like you know, you got to you got to treat it as like, for the most part, partially like canon. You know, you got to treat it like that because it is, even though some of it's old. And I suppose the new stuff supersedes it. You can judge your stuff on that, but I don't know. I'm just ranting again. Oh yeah, well, see you next time. Thank you for supporting the channel, everybody here is supporting the channel and thank you lads uh, if your name isn't on the list it will be in the next one it just depends when i update the list if you would like to join this company of heroes this band of producers who help me out uh help you know support my work on the channel which means i can do more uh yeah you can become a patron on patreon by following the links below and also on subscribe star now because that was requested a few times and um yeah, I've actually got someone on there. <laughs> I was thinking I was getting memed or trolled, man. And then someone actually did. So that's fantastic. And uh, if you or if you don't want to do that and you want to just become a YouTube member, uh, you can click the join button below and you get access to a bunch of um, special badges and things like this. And when I do live streams, you get like you're marked out as special compared to the rest of this riffraff who are in there. Yeah, I'll see you later. Have a good weekend. I hope everything's going well for you guys. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope everything goes well. I'll be back again with more stuff very, very soon. See you later. I still haven't smoked yet either, which is good. I've done a week now. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.